In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, as you can tell, I'm not Pastor Scott. So, uh, welcome to this service. And um, as I told the early service, um, we were able to meet with Stanley yesterday, uh, Castlin and I. And I was telling him how a lot of things are going great in the college ministry, and we're uh, starting to go camping. And then I told him that I'd never been camping before. And he was just jaw dropped. He said, Are you kidding me? You never been camping? And I said, Yeah. And I said, And also, you know, I get the honor to preach this morning. And he goes, How in the world could Scott let you preach? You've never been camping. So <laughs> apparently, I got to apologize to you guys for never going camping before. Um, but as it is, uh, I'm so thankful to be here, and it is a privilege to. Uh, be up here this morning. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Hebrews 12, verse 1. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls." Father God, we just ask you to speak this morning. God, we thank you for what you've already done. God, we praise you for what you will do. And God, open our hearts. God, I pray for anybody here who does not know you as their Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you will penetrate their hearts this morning. God, you will draw them to yourself. Change our hearts, God. Mold us into being made more like you. And God, help us to live this Christian life. Teach us in this Bible study right now. And God, God, we trust. Amen. All right, you guys love Georgia football. I have learned that in my short time being here in Gainesville, and not just in Gainesville, but in Georgia. And I grew up in North Carolina. I'm a Duke fan. None of y'all really care about that. But all of you love, most of you love Georgia football. And something that I came across is you really hate it when you lose. We all do. We all hate it when our teams do not win, and especially in a big game. And that may be too soon to say around this crowd, but it was as if somebody died. I mean, I looked around Gainesville and Georgia, and it was just a sense of gloom after that game. And then I asked some of the college students, hey, how was it on UGA? And they said, it was like somebody died. We were depressed. And I get that because my team loses. Duke is not good at football. Duke is okay at basketball, but they are not good at football. I get the idea of defeat. But no matter what team you pull for, no team always stays on top. No team is always in victory. We all go through cycles, our teams, up and down, up and down. One day they're winning, one day they're losing pretty bad. But as Christians, we also live in that idea as well. As Christians, as believers, I see that we also live in defeat. It's as if there is nothing changed in our life. Because here's the idea. You don't have to live in defeat. There's victory in Christ. We sang about it this morning. There is victory in the name of Jesus. But so often, we walk around and we just live defeated. We have such a stronghold on our life that we just can't get rid of. We can't let go and we live defeated. Some of you are good at putting a mask on. Some of you, every time you come to church, you have the mask, and you're smiling, things are going great. How are you? Oh, I'm doing great. Never been better. And then you go home, and I have no idea what you struggle with. No idea what you struggle with. Some of you, like me, are not so good at showing your emotions on your sleeve. And you show you're defeated. You show that you're hurt. You show that there's pain. And I, and I can't make light of life. Life is hard. Life is difficult. There is pain. There is trials. But we can live in victory. 
in the midst of anything that we go through in this life, we can live in victory in Jesus because he proclaimed that on the cross. When he rose again, he proclaimed victory. His name is victory, and you can live in victory. There's a lie in our minds, and it comes from the enemy, that you're human, and there's no way that you can live in victory. But I'm here to tell you this morning that you can. You can live a victorious life. And the title of my message is Live in Victory. But how in the world can we live in victory? We get in this cycle, don't we? We get in, in, this, in this rut. Ask yourself this morning, am I in a rut? Am I in a cycle of, yeah, there's times where, where I'm joyful and, and there's victory in my life, but those battles are far and few between. Those victories just come and go. More often than not, you find yourself defeated, discouraged, disappointed, hurt. Ask yourself that. Are you in that this morning? And maybe you've come here and you have put that mask on and you've come here and maybe you're just wearing it on your sleeves, just begging for somebody to reach out to you. But I'm here to tell you this morning, no matter what, you can live in victory. No matter what. But the strategy for us to live in victory, what is our strategy? Because here in Hebrews, he's talking about a race. And no matter the sport, no matter what it is in, af- in athletes, they have to have a strategy, a-, a game plan, a plan of attack. So what is our strategy as believers to run this race faithfully and victoriously? Number one, our strategy is to follow the example of those who have won. Follow the example of those who have won. So in January, one of my heroes of the faith, Billy Graham, he passed away. And I have read several of his books and listened to his sermons almost weekly. And he is a man that I look up to in the ministry. He's a man that I've just seen God use so greatly in the almost 100 years of his life. And suddenly he, he started getting sick a couple years ago and then it just all went downhill. And he passed away in January. And, and I'll tell you, that I never, I never met Billy Graham, wished I did, that would have been pretty cool. But I, it, it kind of hurt to, to know that that man of God is gone. But he has an example to follow. He lived faithfully. He preached God's word faithfully. He served God so faithfully. And he lived a victorious life. He's still human, I know, I know he was. But man, was he a man of God. But he does not compare to what we see in Hebrews 11. We have this hall of fame, or the heroes of faith, in Hebrews 11. And it's as if, it's like a memoir of all that happened in the Old Testament. Today, we think about the soldiers who have fought and died. And we, and we praise God for them because it's true. We could not be standing here today if it was not for them freedom. They won victoriously. They fought to the end. But these believers in Hebrews 11, they also fought to the end. They lived a victorious life. And we have a cloud of witnesses to look to. We have these great men and women of God to follow their example and ask the question, how did they live victoriously? Now, if you're anything like me, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, we got Moses, we got Noah, we got David, we got Sarah, we got all these great men and women of God. How in the world could I live up to their expectations? How could I ever live to that standard? What a standard Noah set. What a standard of faith and a leader Moses had. What a standard David had for being a man of God, the man after God's own heart. So, we ask the question, can I really live and follow their example? I mean, even the Apostle Paul, who wrote so many books of the Old Testament, he said, follow my example as I follow Christ. So there must be a way for us to be able to do this. And we have to realize one thing that we kind of miss when reading Scripture. They're not superheroes. They're still men. They're still women. They're still human. Think about it. Yes, 
They live victorious life. But let's think back on a few of them. Let's think of Noah. Okay? Noah, he built the ark. Nobody believed him. He was a crazy man on earth, and, and he was saying it was going to rain, and then it, it started raining, and he built the ark, and boom, he was saved, him and his family. What faith that was. I don't know if you've ever been in a spot where people just do not trust you, and people are laughing at you because you're following Christ, and you're making a decision, and nobody thinks it's the right decision. Well, that's him to a T, hardcore. And Noah builds this ark, and is saved. But then what does he do? He gets off and he gets drunk. Okay, well, that's, you know, okay. Let's think of Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, millions of people across the desert. Really, no road to get them there. No GPS, no satellite, no TV to help, nothing. Just the wilderness and a cloud and fire that God set for them. Leading by faith. And if you ever read in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you see that these people did not like Moses very much. They did not listen to him very much. Very often you see Moses battling to just get their attention, always proclaiming what God said, and they're not listening. They don't obey. Over and over and over again. Just imagine how frustrated you would get in that situation. Just imagine how difficult it would be to lead a nation, millions of people, not ever listening to you. So he gets to a point, and they're begging for water again. They're begging for food again. And he gets discouraged. He gets pretty mad, actually. He gets so frustrated that he slaps a rock and tries to get water to come out of it. Disobeys God completely from what God told him to do. And God said, you know what? You're not going to enter the promised land because of your disobedience to me. Okay? Now let's think of David, the the pinnacle of Old Testament people that we look to. David, the man after God's own heart, committed adultery. Okay. Then he lied. It's getting pretty bad. And then to cover it all up, he murdered But it's the man after God's own heart. How could he do something like that? He's a man. He's still a man. And we still can follow their example because here's what they did that we so often find ourselves doing. They did not let their failures be a stronghold on their life. And they kept running. They're in the heroes of faith They're in the hall of fame of faith because they endure to the end. They live faithfully. They didn't let anything hold them back from truly, wholeheartedly serving God. And we can look to that example right there. Because how encouraging is it to know that you're not alone in this walk? You don't have to show your hand by raising it, but I'll tell you, there's often that I feel alone. Do you feel alone? that nobody really understands what you're going through in your walk with Christ, the struggles that you have, the pain that you go through. Nobody gets it. Nobody understands. We have examples to follow. These people endured. These people went through a lot. And they are in the hall of fame of Christians because they live faithfully and they live victoriously. In the midst of failures, they lived victoriously because they endure to the end. They finished the race well. And that's what we're called to do. We're called to finish the race well. But here's the second thing of our strategy. Our second strategy is to remove what is holding you back. There are things in our life that we have to get rid of if we're going to live victoriously. If you're looking at your heart, you're looking at yourself, and you just feel defeated, you walk around and you are defeated. You're so discouraged. Maybe there's things in your life, and maybe you don't realize it, or maybe you do, that you have to just get rid of. The word here, lay aside, in verse 1 is apotithemi in the Greek, and it literally means to totally trash away, to get rid of. When Castle and I moved 
uh, from our apartment to here. We lived in a small two-bedroom apartment, not really had a whole lot, but we realized that we had a closet full of junk. I'm not sure if any of you have a closet or a house or anything full of junk, but we were in that situation a year and a half married, and we already had a lot of junk we did not need. So we went through it. We spent a couple of days just going through everything that we had. To, I mean, we haven't used in a year, so what's the point of having it? So we just trashed some of it. We took it to uh, the dumpster. We took it to Goodwill. We took it to Salvation Army. We just got rid of it. We had to get out of our house, get out of our possession, because it was weighing us down. I did not want to move that. So we got rid of it. Well, there's things in your life that you have to get rid of. And here, the author of Hebrews points out two specific things. He first says, wait. And the idea of wait is something that hinders us from doing something, a burden. How many of you are burdened this morning? You, again, you don't have to show your hands by that. But are you burdened this morning? Do you have something in your life that is totally holding you back? Because ultimately, a wait is something that holds you back from your God-given potential. And every single one of you has a God-given potential. No matter who you are, no matter where you are in life, you have a God-given potential that God has called you to do. But there are weights in our life that hold us back. This idea of ensnare that we see in this passage is something that chokes us. Something that has a grip on us that we can't breathe. Do you feel like you can't breathe this morning? I feel like the youths are so defeated in your life. There's weights in our life that we have to get rid of. And I'm not talking about the weight that you do when you weight lift. I don't do that. I'm going to probably start trying to do that here soon. I'm not sure about it, though, because I don't lift weights. Never, never really have. And, yeah, that's just how it is for me. But we all have weights in our life that we must get rid of. So what's your weight? Is it the weight of discouragement? Are you discouraged this morning? Maybe your weight is the weight of comparison. You just find yourself so often comparing to others. You know, our world, our age that we live in, is the most technologically advanced age, and yet we're the most stressed out and have the most anxiety of all ages. It's actually been said that USA stands for United States of Anxiety because we are so stressed out. No matter what technology that we have, no matter how fast our fingertips can move to type stuff and get information, we have so much information coming to us that we are just so stressed out. And one of the biggest information that we have is comparing to each other. We're always seeing what everybody's doing, what everybody looks like. And we just compare. I'll never be like them. I can never dress like them. I'll never look like them. I'll never act like them. I'll never talk like them. I'll never fill in the blank. And we compare ourselves. And adults, don't think you do this. Because you do. It's not just teenagers. It's not just young adults. We all compare. Every single one of us compares the people. And it's a weight in our life that is holding us back. And maybe your weight is guilt. Maybe you have done something in your life that you just cannot get past, that you don't believe that you're forgiven of. But I'm here to tell you this morning that God can forgive any sin. And he loves you so deeply that he died for you. And no matter your guilt, no matter your sin, God loves you. And you are forgiven. But maybe your weight is the weight of fear. You don't know what the future holds. How can we? We don't know what the next two hours holds. How can we understand what's going to happen in our life? How can we know what your kids will grow up and be like? How can you know if you're going to be financially stable when you get older, when you retire? It's a fear. We always have this fear, and it's holding us back. We are so weighed down by fear in this life that we, it's like we can't move. We're paralyzed. And God says, get rid of it. Get rid of the weight in your life. We are not meant to be weighed down by burdens. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 and 30 says, 
Come to me, all you who are late, who, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. First Peter five seven says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So what is your weight in your life that is holding you back? But now, when we get down to it, all weights in themselves aren't bad. Let's think about this. We need food. We need water. Now some of you are like, yes, I need food. Hurry up. Like, we need food. When I was running cross country, our coach, every morning for breakfast that we had uh, a meat, he would give us bagels and some orange juice to get us ready for the meat. And then after we ran, he would give us bananas and some Gatorade to replenish us. Now, can you imagine if we sat there at the starting line? And for those of you who run, this is, you find this quite ridiculous. Can you imagine holding a bagel and running and eating it while you're running? Can you imagine doing that? But I need this bagel. I need to eat it. So you're sitting there, and you're ready to start, and you got this bagel, and you're just chomping on it like crazy. You're starving, and then you start running. Do you think you'd be running very long? Of course not. Do you think that you have much endurance without it coming back up? Absolutely not. You're not going to finish that race. But you need to eat. Yeah, you do, but not right then. Food in itself is not bad. But while you're eating it, while you're trying to run a race, that's bad. There's things in your life that may in and of itself not be bad, but it's holding you back from God. And I don't know what that is. Only you do. That's between you and the Lord. But maybe it's something that really is, is not a bad thing, but it has become a bad thing because you've let it be a stronghold on your life. It is keeping you from God. It is keeping you from living that God-given potential. Lay aside, get rid of every weight. And then he also says, Get rid of sin. Sin is a matter of the heart. We all sin. We've all fallen short. We all struggle with it. And I don't know what your sin is, but I'll tell you, if anything entangles you and chokes you, it's going to be sin. And it will choke the life right out of you. But at times, sin seems enjoyable, doesn't it? It's glamorous. I mean, if it wasn't, why would we want it? If, if sin didn't have any, any kind of enjoyment, why would we be enticed to it whatsoever? But we are, because for just a season, for just a moment, sin is enjoyable. But all it leads to is destruction and death and defeat in your life. And I don't know what sin you struggle with. Maybe it's the sin of lust. Or maybe it's pride or envy. Whatever that sin is that you deal with, you must get rid of it if you're going to live victoriously. Because you cannot live victoriously in sin. Living in sin is living in defeat. But the author of Hebrews doesn't actually lay out a list of sins as other passages of Scripture that we see do. For example, Paul lists uh, the fruit of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. We, we don't see that here. We don't see a, a list that, that kind of gives us a good idea of what he's talking about. So doing some digging, doing some thinking, we think about the context. And we think about Hebrews 11 talks about faith. And here we're running by faith. So one can assume that the sin that he may be talking about is the sin of unbelief. The sin of unbelief. Do you realize it's a sin to not believe God at his word? Let's think all the way back to the Garden of Eden. This is the tactic that Satan has used for millennia. Adam and Eve, they're walking in a garden, and we've heard a story. I mean, if you grew up in church for five minutes, you've heard this story of Adam and Eve. You're walking through the, they're walking through the garden, and they come across the serpent. And the serpent says and asks this question, Did God really say... 
did God really say? Because God said not to eat the fruit because for eating of it, you shall surely die. Death would start. In the Hebrew, that's really cool because it actually means dying, you shall die, which means your death begins. So did God really say that you would die when you eat this fruit? Did, Did God really say that? Can you really trust God at his word? And then that started the downward downward spiral of Adam and Eve. And that is what brought sin into this world, is unbelief. Not holding onto the promises and truth of God's word. But we find ourselves in that so often, don't we? We don't take God at his word. The enemy will use circumstances. He will use problems in life. He will use issues He'll use pain, he'll use people, he'll use circumstances to make us doubt and hold on to God's word. And maybe you find yourself in that position this morning, that you're doubting God's promises, that you're doubting whether you can believe this book. Yeah, we talk about that this is, this is God's word, but, but can we believe it? Can we trust it? Can we hold on to it? And so often Satan is is telling us and whispering us, you can't trust this. You can't rely on this. You can't, you can't. Did God really say, but I'm here to tell you that you can trust God. No matter what Satan says, no matter what the world says, you can trust God at his promises because his word is faithful and his word is truth. Our society struggles with this idea of truth. This idea of, well, what's true for me is not true for you, and what's true for you is not true for me, and et cetera, and et cetera. Well, I'm here to tell you that's hogwash. Because truth is God's word. And we can trust it, we can hold on to it, no matter what anybody says. But are you trusting God? You may ask yourself all the time, why am I so defeated? Why can I not live victoriously? Well, are you trusting God at his word? Are you pouring God's word into your heart? Because do you realize that Satan, the enemy, is going to pour lies into your mind constantly? And the only way to battle against that is to get into God's word and to pour truth into your mind. So are you pouring truth? Are you soaking your mind, your soul, everything that you are in the promises of God? Because how did, how did Jesus battle the temptation and the lies of Satan? He battled it with God's word. And that is the only way that we're going to live victoriously is if we soak our minds and our hearts into God's promises and into God's word. Psalm 119.11 says, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. So according to this passage, the way that you don't sin is hiding God's word in your heart. Are you finding yourself in a constant cycle of defeat and sin, of weight? Is it just an up and down roller coaster? Are you just constantly getting dizzy from your defeat? You got a battle of victory and then you got several of defeat. Do you find yourself in that this morning? You must battle it with holding onto God's promises, trusting in God's word. But the third strategy that we see in this passage For us to live a victorious life, to live in victory, is to trust in Christ. Look at verse 2 with me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. No matter the example of the Old Testament or no matter the example of somebody like Billy Graham, Christ is our ultimate example, and he is our ultimate authority, and he's the one that we look to. Here in this passage, he says, author and finisher of our faith. Author literally means founder or the source of our faith, and finisher means perfecter. So basically this is saying Christ has made the way for you to live faithfully. He is the source 
of you living in victory, and he's the perfecter of you living in victory. He is the source of your power, the source of your strength. The same strength that held Moses together, that held David together, that held Noah together, that held all these great men and women of faith. The same, the same power that held Paul together and Jesus is in you. The Holy Spirit is living inside of you as a believer. And you have full access to the power of God. Why can't we live in victory if we have the access, the full 100% access to God? God of the universe. Go back and read Genesis 1 every once in a while. It'll give you some encouragement. If he created all this, he can tr- you can trust him. If he created the world and he saved your soul, if you're trusting God with your soul, you can trust him with anything. Christ paid that ultimate price for you, and that's where our faith is found. And if we are trusting in that, we can trust in anything through Christ. That's what it means by I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's not talking about throwing a football or shooting a basketball. It's talking about living for Jesus faithfully. It's talking about trusting Christ. It's talking about living for him and living in victory. So why don't you? What is holding you back from living a victorious life? Are you trusting God? Are you trusting Christ? Are you looking to him always? And this means not just when you're going through something. Because so often we turn to Christ when we're struggling, when, when we're going through a problem, when something comes up. That's when we trust in Christ. But why don't we trust in Christ always? He is the source of our strength. We can't live this Christian life without the power of Christ soaring through us. So what is keeping you from trusting in Christ? Because you will never live a victorious life without surrendering completely to Jesus. But why should we trust Jesus? We see it in verse 2. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You are that joy that was set before him. He knew that dying on that cross would save your soul. That you would have access to the throne of God a relationship with him. Because what is our prize in running this race? We run this race to live eternity with Jesus, to see him face to face. That is our prize. That is our goal. And Jesus made it completely possible for us to live with him for eternity. We don't have to go to hell. We don't have to be separated from God for eternity. Our sin separates us, but God has made the way for us to be redeemed for us to be reunited with our God and our Savior and our Lord and our Creator. But what is keeping you from living in that? You proclaim Christ. You proclaim salvation. But what is holding you back? What is making you in a standstill, in a rut that you cannot get out of? You have to ask yourself this question because we are called to live victoriously. We are called to live by faith and not by sight. But see, we look to what Jesus did on that cross. Through that pain, we talk about it often at Easter, but it's, it's like the thought of what Jesus did on the cross kind of stays at Easter. It's talked about at Easter and it stayed at Easter. But Easter should be every day for us because Jesus died for you on that cross, paid that price, took those beatings, took that cursing, took the whipping, took the crown of thorns. And, and, and we talk about it, we read about it, but we honestly cannot imagine the suffering and pain that Jesus went through on the cross. But even more than all of that, he took the weight, the sin of the world on his shoulders, on himself. Literally, Scripture says that he who knew no sin became sin for us that we may be reconciled to God. That is what Christ did for you. Your sin, your pain, he took it. He endured it on the cross. And he endured because he loved you so much. Because he desired you so much. God does not desire for any to perish but for all to come to repentance. 
And that is his desire for you this morning. And Jesus, while he was on that cross, he proclaimed something that I think we forget about often. I know I do. He was on there suffering. He couldn't breathe, trying to lift up, gasping for every breath. And he said, To tell us die, it is finished. Your victory was won. That is where we claim victory. So if you're living this life defeated, if you just can't seem to hang your head high and you're a believer this morning, I'm here to tell you that you can and you should because Jesus paid it joyfully for you and we can live joyfully for him because we trust in that. We hold on to that. We don't let anything in this world hold us back and have a stronghold on us and keep us down and keep us back. But we trust in Christ and we run this race faithfully because of what he did for us. But if you're not a believer this morning, if you've never given your life to Christ, maybe that's why that you live in defeat. And maybe you're just questioning, how can I live victoriously? By surrendering and trusting all you are to Jesus. Because no matter what, God loves you, and he died for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't know what you're dealing with this morning, but I want you to search your heart. I want you to ask God, what is holding me back from living for you? What is holding me back, whether it's a weight or a sin in your life, what is keeping you from living victoriously the only way that we're going to see revival in this nation and upon this land is for us to live victoriously in Christ. And we can. But maybe you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. And with every head bowed and every eye closed, I don't want anybody looking around. I, I promise you I won't, I won't say a word. But it's by a show of hands. Is that you this morning? Are you defeated are you defeated? Just raise your hand if you just feel a sense of defeat in your life. Just by a raise of hands. Thank you. But now maybe you don't know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you don't know him personally. Please come to this altar. Please lay it at Christ's feet because he loves you so greatly. Let's pray. Dear God, I ask you, Lord, move in hearts. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can trust it. And God, thank you that you loved us so much to die for us. God, help us to not leave here unchanged. God, help us to not live in defeat. Help us to live victoriously in you. In Jesus' name.